Good morning. Good morning, Vanya. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Park Victoria Baptist Church. My name is Vanya, and I'm a member here. Um, and before we get started with the praise and worship, I just have a few announcements. So first, this afternoon at 4.30 here in our sanctuary, we have the prayer and praise. Um, and we will be studying Deuteronomy f- uh, 6, 4 to 5. Um, and then also we have signups at the lobby today for the Membership Matters course if you want to become a member of this church. Um, and that Membership Matters course is going to be on April 27th. Okay, so that's going to be, it's going to help you get to know our church and know our beliefs um, and just get started on that foundation. And lastly, Sunday after the morning service on April 28th, there's going to be a members meeting. Okay, so there's um, there's going to be a meal. You can join us for that, and you'll learn about what's happening in the coming months and how you can join us and serve the Lord. 
And before I pray, I just want to read this verse from 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11. I'm reading from the NLT version, if you want to follow along. And it goes, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come together and bring praise to your name, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you hear our praise and that our the congregation just explodes with worship, Lord God. Like your word says, you are over everything, Lord God. All glory, power, and honor is to you, Lord. Um, we just raise our voices and praise your name, Lord God. And we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, church. Let's stand as we worship our Lord together, who is worthy of all praise.
Jesus, the name that is above every other name, and at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, he is Lord. Thank you. 
We need the Lord, don't we, church? song to rise to you. When temptation comes 
is my way. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My Morning. 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 Let me read to you First Chronicles 29, verse 9. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David, the king, also rejoiced greatly. In verse 10, it's David's prayer. Let it also be our prayer. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Amen. Good morning, church. Join me now as we pray.
Sovereign Lord, you are seated on your throne right now. No matter what life may feel in the moment, your reign and your rule are never shaken. You are robed in majesty, you are armed with strength. Indeed, the world and your kingdom are firm and secure in your hands. And so, Lord, we come to you, Lord, needing you, recognizing more and more just our inability and our lack of power, our lack of knowledge, our lack of ability to to do all that is set before us, Lord. We cannot even change a single hair on our head, nonetheless change the tides of the world. And so we come, Lord, praying, Lord, pray for the, the, the nation of Chile, Lord, we we pray for for the nation of Chile and ask God that you would advance the gospel there, Lord. There in that nation, Father, that you would break down the the strongholds of Catholicism and secularism, Lord, and just allow the, the gospel to go free, Father. Open people's eyes and hearts. Open up the churches there, Lord, to to proclaim the fullness of your truth, the fullness of the word, that they would guard the truth faithfully and that the people there in Chile would hunger for it, Lord. We pray, God, that you would help them to sense the emptiness of the vain pursuits they are trusting in and help them, Lord, to instead trust in Christ alone. Now, we also pray, God, for our our own state and the work taking place here and think of just the California Southern Baptist Convention, Lord, and we just pray for the, our state convention that you would help us, Lord, as, as a collection of Southern Baptist churches to advance your kingdom here. Lord, help us, Father, to cooperate well. Help us, Father, to keep the main thing, the main thing, which is seeing lost souls saved, churches strengthened, churches planted, and seeing uh, the state transformed with the gospel. And so we just pray for the leadership. Think of Pete Ramirez, the executive director, and others that work with him. We just pray that you'd give Pete uh, wisdom, boldness, and courage, and conviction in the word, Lord, to, to proclaim it fully, to teach and lead in accordance with it, Lord. And strengthen them, Lord. Protect them and their families as they seek to do your will, Lord. Protect them from the enemy who will seek to tear down and destroy. And for our own congregation, Lord, we just pray, Father, for for our own unity, God, in Christ. That in a world that is often divided by differences, Lord, let us remember that none of those differences compare to the unity we share in Christ. Lord, you are the one that said there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. So we pray that you would break down any barriers that may be existing or growing or that could come in our church, Lord, that you would protect us and help us be united, help us to remain united, and help us, God, to display the gospel in our unity. We just thank you for the unity we do share in Christ. We thank you for that treasure and for that privilege. And also our, our members, Lord, we, we just thank you, Father, for, for Frank Caoli, Lord, that we thank you for Frank, God, just giving him this healing, Lord, even just the fact that he's able to worship with us today, God. We, we thank you for uh, the protection that you've given him and, and just the speedy recovery he has, Lord, and the strength and vigor you've given him, Lord. And, and we just pray Father, that you would continue to help him fully recover, Lord, that you would continue to protect his body and that you would help him, Lord, to uh, use each day to glorify you, Lord. We pray, Father, for just their whole family just to be encouraged and strengthened in this. And for our church as a whole, Lord, we just pray that as we come to your word, that you, Lord, would speak 
Your truth and your gospel have been entrusted to us in an age that is shifting, in an age that no longer finds usefulness in the Christian doctrines. Lord, help us to stand true. Help us, God, to guard it. Help us, Lord, to cling to it all the more, Lord, to hold to the truths of the gospel, to hold to the truths of your word, Lord, to to take the warning seriously and to hold one another up, Lord. And so as we come, Father, we, we pray for you to hear us and keep us and sustain us. And speak in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, whenever I visit a new city, one. There we go. Whenever I visit a new city, one of my favorite things to do is visit old churches. I don't know how else to explain it, but walking in places where Christians have been worshiping Jesus for hundreds of years and walking where hundreds of thousands of hours have been spent singing, praying, and praising God, where where countless souls have been convicted under the word and spirit at work there. Something about walking those kinds of places always fills me with a sense of awe. Those, Those moments remind me how the gospel and God's kingdom are so much bigger than just us in our present age. That it, that it spans far beyond us and our, and our area. And when I visit those churches, I feel like I could sit there all day and just reflect on how gracious God has been to us across the ages. But sometimes, as I reflect there, a sobering moment comes stealing the wind out of my sails. I learned this or that building no longer has a church actually meeting in it. Maybe it's been sold. Maybe it's just a historical monument. Or I've seen many churches these days refurbished into bars and stores and clubs. And many others, you can see many around the bay just being sold. Property sold, buildings demolished. I know many here have even come from churches like that. That church where you came from no longer exists. They've perhaps sold their properties with little to no sign that they ever existed anymore. I even know of churches today in the process of trying to sell their properties and just planning basically to finish out what few years they have left with the money it buys them. So why do congregations like these die? It's a reality that hits close to home because we see so many in the Bay facing this. There are countless specifics and events that contribute to the process, but at its core, for most, it's a slow but clear process in the end that history confirms time and time again. And and many, and that is that many lose their resilience and become brittle because of the fact that they have stopped living by the truth of the gospel and God's word. The truth goes from what consumes their lives and consumes their families to being just assumed and in some cases even lost. Today we are starting a short series through the pastoral epistles. And each sermon will answer a question that seeks to get at the heart of what makes a resilient church. What makes a resilient church that keeps on the true path of the gospel and word? So today we will answer answer in 1 Timothy the question, how does the church stay on track? How do we avoid the common pitfalls and avoid becoming brittle as a church? And then, Lord willing, the next two weeks we'll answer, how do we thrive in dark and difficult times in 2 Timothy? Knowing that just because we believe and do the right things, it doesn't mean we won't still face hard times. And then we'll look at Titus to ask, how can we see the world transformed? How can we see the world transformed? And so each question gets at a part of this solution. What keeps a church from dying? What keeps a church resilient and on the true path of the faith? 
And so the, the goal in each sermon is to do an overview of the entire book that we'll talk about. And the goal of an overview sermon isn't to answer all the questions that might exist in that book of the Bible. But it aims instead to understand the author's central message to that book, which is what we will tackle these next three weeks. What, what is the central message to each one of these books? And so these next few weeks, you want to be sure you have an open Bible before you because we're going to cover quite a bit of ground in each sermon. We'll try to provide some of the verses up on the screen for you, but it will be very helpful to just have an open Bible and walk through along with it as well. So if you're using one of the Bibles we provided and the shelves beneath many of the seats in front of you, you'll find our passage, our letter of 1 Timothy, beginning on page 1093 in those Bibles. In page 1093. So to begin with, just setting a little bit of a context for this letter of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is a letter Paul wrote to his disciple and close protege, Timothy, Of whom Paul said in chapter 1 of verse 2 that Timothy is his genuine child in the faith. You can move the slide if you want to keep up. We're going to have to, we're going to work the guys up there real hard today. They're going to be flipping through a lot of slides. So, but Paul says in in chapter 1 of verse 2 that Timothy is his genuine child in the faith. And in verse 3, Paul says that when he was going on to another city, he exhorted Timothy to remain on at Ephesus so that he could command certain ones not to teach a different doctrine. And then in chapter 3 of verse 15, Paul said he is writing this letter to Timothy in case Paul is delayed so that Timothy and the church will know how one ought to conduct themselves in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. So what we see here in in what Paul is writing is he's writing to his close and beloved disciple so that Timothy, this disciple, might continue the work there in Ephesus where he left him for at least a time until Paul returns. But we know that this letter, though addressed to Timothy in the beginning, isn't meant just for Timothy's ears. It's not like we're peeping into a private letter Paul was writing to Timothy alone. Because when we look at chapter 6 of verse 21, we see the blessing there at the end where it says, in most translations, grace be with you. A more literal word there would actually be grace be with you all or grace be with y'all if you're from my neck of the woods. So it's, it's a plural you. It's not just a singular you, Timothy. It's you all. And so Paul is writing this letter with a plural blessing at the end to indicate that this letter, while addressed to Timothy, was to be read and used by all in the church because it lays out the truths for how we should conduct ourselves as a church family. And Paul wanted to see not just Timothy be able to help churches be resilient, but he wanted the church itself to be able to hold itself to being resilient. And so today, as we walk through the letter of 1 Timothy, we'll see Paul gives three truths that we'll highlight. Three truths for the church to live by. Truth number one, if you're following along in the bulletin, is where you can fill in if you like. Truth number one, we are needy. We are needy. Chapter one, verses one to chapter two, verse 15. Truth number two, qualified authorities are a blessing. Chapter 3, verses 1 to chapter 4, verse 5. And then chapter 3 is godliness is our gain. Godliness is our gain. Chapter 4, verse 6, all the way to the end. So we are needy, qualified authorities are a blessing, and godliness is our gain. And for those interested in a more detailed outline, we've also provided a little insert bulletin there for you in the bulletin that has a more detailed outline that you can use and reference. You can keep in your Bible for further study if you like. But beginning with truth number one, Paul, after reminding Timothy that that he is there in Ephesus to help the church stay true to the gospel and true to the word, Paul then reflects on why sticking to this gospel is so important. He explains that it isn't just a philosophical idea that we are bringing to people, but we are bringing a message that saves. We are bringing a message that saves. And this message, Paul says, has been entrusted to him, Paul, to see it spread faithfully. So he says in 1 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 12, 
You can look there with me if you like. He says, I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me. That is, he has enabled me to do this task because he regarded me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet, and and this is the incredible news of this message, yet I was shown mercy. I was not given what I deserved, essentially, is what he's saying. Because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. His surplus of grace was overwhelmingly more than I needed. And so he says, with the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And then Paul, in chapter 1 of verse 15, gives us the first of three trustworthy sayings. And it's these trustworthy sayings that give us the three truths that the church is to live by. The first truth Paul introduces us to when he says in chapter 1 of verse 15, he says, it is a trustworthy saying and deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost. Yet for this reason, I was shown mercy so that in me as the foremost, Christ might demonstrate all his patience as an example for those who are going to believe upon him for eternal life. So Paul is saying truth number one is we are needy. We we need saving. And, And Christ came into the world to save. But who did he come into the world to save? But who did Jesus come to save? The self righteous? The strong? The faithful? The obedient? No, none of these. He came to save none of these. Jesus came to save sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. And Paul exemplifies for us all what we must all know in our hearts. We are the foremost, the chief, the worst sinner we know. We are the worst sinner we know. Not that other person. Not your neighbor. Not the person in the history books. Because again, you really don't know the depths of their sin. Like you know the depths of your sin. No other human knows our sins and struggles and our struggles with sin like we ourselves do. Spurgeon said once, if any man thinks ill or poorly of you, do not be angry with him. For you are worse than he thinks you to be. Don't be angry with someone if they think ill of you because you're worse than what they know. Is that true? You know yourself, Christian, and we are all sinners. And and no other human knows deep down that that, 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 even the half of it like you do of yourself. But that is the mercy of God. That that is the, the mercy. He knows it all. He knows even more than we do. And yet he saved us. He saved us to demonstrate his patience and love for all. And so if he could save you, if he could save me, he can save anyone. Amen. And so this is a truth the church must stand on, that we are needy. And we never leave that. We never leave that posture. We are needy. And that is our our greatest. And that is our greatest need. Greater than. Our job security, greater than our popularity in school, greater than having a family. Jesus meets our greatest need, which is sin. If you are in Christ, your greatest need, your greatest obstacle in life and in death has been met. If that has been met, there is nothing else to compare. Nothing else even comes close. Nothing competes with that great need. But our needs don't stop there at salvation. When we are saved, everything isn't put in order and made perfect. So how do we go about facing these needs that still do exist? Paul says in chapter 1, of verse, in chapter one verse 17 to 20, that he's going to give Timothy a command by which he will be able to face these needs. And so he gives the command beginning in chapter 2 of verse 1. Look with me there. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, First of all, then, the first command I give, 
is I exhort that petitions and prayers, requests and thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. Paul is saying, how do we become resilient? How do we face these other needs? We pray. We pray. It may sound like a Sunday school answer, but it's the truth. How do you face the needs that still are before you? You pray. You pray for one another. You pray for God's kingdom because we are all needy, church. We must be a people of prayer. So since we are needy and the people around us are needy, needing saving as well, but also needing other things, we pray. And what we have to ask is, do our prayers reflect this truth that we are needy? When we look at how needy we are, do our prayers meet that need? Do we demonstrate by how we pray that we are that needy? Paul said to be unceasing in our prayers. Why? Because our needs are unceasing. So do we see ourselves to be needy? Not only for salvation, but for God and for his hand at work in our lives. Do we think, oh, well, the Christian walk is just let God take care of that salvation thing and then I can take care of the rest? Prayer is one of the greatest thermometers to test and assess our spiritual vitality. Both as a church corporately and as individuals and as a family. Do you want to know how your faith is doing? All it takes is a quick assessment. How is your prayer life? Is your prayer life indicating someone that's living or someone that's on life support, barely making it? This has been a conviction for me. I've been growing comfortable. And my prayer life indicates it because it's dwindling, it's weakening, it's lessening. My my sense of urgency and need for prayer is decreasing. And that tells me I'm losing sight of my neediness for God. And so I need you to be praying for me as we pray for one another. As we look at our own lives, are we praying in light of our need? But then the neediness of the church continues when Paul begins to describe how men and women both need to seek humility. So it's not only that we need salvation, we need prayers, but we also need humility. And we can see this most clearly if we go on and jump ahead to chapter 2 of verse 9. Or verse 9 of chapter 2. Paul says, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, with modesty and self-restraint, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly clothing, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, professing godliness. He's saying, let your greatest source of beauty, ladies, not be the vanities of this world, but in your modest godliness. Now, Paul's not describing what our outfit should look like in this case. He's giving us examples. So if you came here with braided hair, it's okay. But Paul here isn't just poking at women. That important word there that starts this verse, likewise, indicates that Paul is saying, just as men, women. Men are to be this way, and likewise, women are to be this way. So both men and women should be adorning themselves with godliness. With humble godliness, not seeking vain displays of beauty, but seeking to display the beauty of the heart. Paul is calling us to all humbly seek to live godly lives. He's pointing out our mutual need for this here, both men and women. And then he comes to a passage, though, that focuses more squarely on women. Look with me at chapter 2, verse 12 to 15. Chapter 2, verse 12 to 15. Paul says... So kind of setting the context here logically, he says, while I call both men and women to live this humble, godly way together, they're both called to humility. 
There is a distinction or limitation to be had in how this plays out between the sexes. He says, beginning in verse 12, But I do not allow a woman to teach, or that is, exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now stop there. Paul is giving us one principle with an application. The principle here is that women are not to exercise authority over a man. And context is key here because we know Paul is writing this letter, as he said in chapter 3, verse 15, that he's writing it to the church. And so Paul, we know, is talking about how women are to seek humility in the context of the church. And while both men and women seek humility and godliness, Paul says men and women are to apply this principle differently. They are not interchangeable. Women are not to teach or exercise authority over men in the church, he says. And in case we thought Paul was just applying this limitation to only Ephesus or to a particular issue in Ephesus or to the Greek culture, Paul grounds his logic and reasoning itself in three things. He bases it in men and women's relationship before the fall. He bases it in the fall itself. And then he bases it after the fall. So if you thought, oh, this is just fallen nature, this is Paul living out fallen nature stuff, but we're redeemed, we're a new creation. Well, no, 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 Paul's saying this was the case before the fall, this is the case during the fall, and after the fall. So you can't miss this. So verse, beginning in verse 13, he says, he says his reasoning is, for it was Adam who was first formed, and then Eve. So pre-fall, man was first, he says, before woman. And... It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into trespass. So the logic here is that when the fall happens, it was due to the fact of the woman going before the man when it should have been the other way around. But she will be saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctification with self-restraint. So this is the result of post-fall. While the first two points might make some semblance of sense, at least what Paul's saying here, the last part, that salvation through bearing children, might seem odd and confusing at first. But what Paul's doing here is not saying that women must have children to be saved. No, Paul elsewhere has even commended singleness as a gift in 1 Corinthians 7. But he here selects childbearing to exemplify the God-ordained differences between men and women. Just as women were bearing children before the fall... Because the fall didn't bring about childbearing. The fall brought about pain in childbearing. So what he's saying here is just as women are still bearing children after the fall, so too does that stay the same after you come to Christ. It's not like once you come to faith, now men all of a sudden are having babies, unlike what our society says. So what he's saying here is, That just as women are being saved and are still women after being saved, still bear children, so too, Paul argues, that women after being saved are still called to the humble position. The humble position to uh, submit to worthy, godly authority. So what Paul has been calling the church to do here in this first section is he's calling us, church, to live out the truth without shame that we are needy. We need saving. We never stop needing God's grace and mercy. We must be the people who down in our very core know that we need God. We need him. We need to pray to him. We need to humbly seek him and his peace and and in the posture he calls us to take. We need to trust him in it all. The congregation that dies is the one where people stop being open and honest about their struggles and their needs about their need for God and for one another. The congregation that dies is the one that forgets, maybe not conceptually, but how they act towards one another. They forget that we are all the chief sinners. We are all in desperate need of God, in desperate need of prayer, and prayer together and prayer for one another, in desperate need to fight for humility. None of this comes easy. So what does this mean for us here at PVBC? It means we can rest. It means we can rest. We we can, we can let go of the facades. We don't have to come here 
and think that we have to have it all together. We don't have to come here expecting our lives, our marriages, our kids, our faith and jobs, that it's all put together. We can come and must come needy and broken. And we must share that burden with each other. We must share it with one another. Some of the most dangerous ailments you can have in a human body are the ones you don't know are there until it's too late. There is no pain or, or no signal, no, no symptoms until the artery is clogged or the cancer is too advanced to do anything about. The church is the same way. Don't keep your pain and your struggles and your needs hidden. Pray, meet together, encourage one another, share with one another. That, that is what this truth lived out looks like. That, that is why it's so encouraging when I stumble upon the, the members of our church praying together after or before the service or at other times. It's, it's, it's obvious someone has just shared something and the other person says, you know what, we should pray. Or, or I hear about how our church is taking care of one another, how we're bringing meals or gifts, or we're meeting with one another, counseling one another, spending time with one another, even with people you don't even know yet. But you heard they're in need, you heard they're, they're a part of our body, and you come around them. That, that is how we live this out together. And it's so encouraging to see it all here. And so keep at it and keep working at it. That's what this truth calls us to. But Paul comes... To the second truth then, that the church should live by, beginning in chapter 3 of verse 1, where he begins to discuss how qualified authorities are a blessing. Look with me in in chapter 3 of verse 1. Paul gives us our second trustworthy saying. He says, it is a trustworthy saying, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a good work. Pause there. An overseer is one of the three different names given to the role of pastor. The the various titles, overseer, elder, pastor, are all interchangeably used, synonymously used. And they all give a different twist to the focus or role the pastor is charged with. Elder focuses on the maturity they are supposed to embody. They're an elder. Pastor shifts the focus upon the shepherding or defending the flock in that role. While overseer looks at the role and how it's meant to oversee or lead and direct things. Hence why Paul gives the warning in chapter 3 verse 5 here that if a man does not know how to lead his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So the idea there is the overseer, elder, pastor is meant to lead the church, to lead it and counsel it. And so Paul says that the men in the church who aspire to to an office to this office to desire a good work. It isn't something to shy away from. But something, Paul says, that is desirable and good. If you look through the whole list of qualifications there from verses 1 to uh, about, um, wrong book there, in verses 1 to about verse 7, except for the qualification of teaching, we should all aspire to those qualities there. And we should all desire to be like this. And Ephesians 4, 10 to 11 tells us that pastors are a gift to the church. That's what Jesus left behind as one of the gifts to the church. They're one of the blessings to the church from Christ when they are doing the work they're called to. So we should desire many more gifts, many more pastors given to the church. But desire for the office isn't enough. Paul continues in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to begin describing what we should look for in a pastor overseer when he says, an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Stop there. In short, they are to be model citizens, model citizens of the faith. They're not first and foremost employees of the church that we delegate responsibility to, but they are examples to the church. And that is why whenever you find in the Bible references to elder or pastor, if it isn't referring to the role generically as it is here, it is always, always used in a plural form. Because no one man can be the sole example we need in a church. No one can do that. 
If the overseer elder is a blessing and a gift, then why would we only want one or two or three? As in our case, we have three. We're blessed with three pastors, elders, overseers. But we should want many more. We should pray for more, that God would raise up more men that could fill those shoes. And that if not to fill the shoes here, who he might raise up from here to go elsewhere as well. That we could pass on the DNA to other churches and strengthen them as well. So be praying who, who, who God might be working in to raise up for that. But the overseer elder isn't the only human authority in the church. We know that the Bible teaches there are two offices in the church. The other is deacon. And so Paul in chapter 3 of verse 8 begins by saying deacons likewise, meaning this expectation and blessing found in godly qualified authorities aren't just for the overseer, but the deacon likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not fond of dishonest gain. Essentially, our, our deacons too must be model citizens and examples for us. They are a blessing to the church, just as we see exemplified when the first set of deacons were chosen in Acts chapter 6. There we see the result of godly qualified deacons. After being chosen, it says in Acts 6 verse 7, that after they chose godly deacons, the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of disciples continued to multiply greatly in Jerusalem. So faithfulness and fruitfulness. Faithfulness and fruitfulness often go hand in hand. As we seek to be faithful to his word, as we strive to be more faithful, it shouldn't surprise us when we see more fruit emerge. Though Acts 6 is also a good way to see that it shouldn't surprise us either when persecution emerges and suffering. As is the case with the martyrdom of deacon Stephen. But Paul is showing Timothy and the church that just as we saw that truth number one is to live as a to live by as a church is that we are needy. Truth number two is equally important as Paul shows us that qualified authorities are a blessing to be desired. They are a good thing to desire and have and pray for a surplus of which is why Paul gives us a warning beginning in chapter 3 verse 14 which further lays the case for the importance of these qualified authorities paul says beginning in verse 13 i'm writing these things to you hoping to come to you soon but in case i'm delayed i write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of god which is the church of the living god the pillar and support of the truth Paul is saying these truths, these things he's explaining to Timothy and the church are meant to help us know how to conduct ourselves as a church. And the church here, we see, is not some free-form organization that that we can just lead and conduct with our own whims and desires. We, We cannot lead or arrange it with just a pragmatic or preferential approach to it. That is the same faulty logic that caused the fall. And it is the same logic that caused the many stumblings we see in Israel, trying to go as every man thought best. Read the book of Judges and see how that goes. The church is not ours. Paul says it is the living God. And if that weren't enough to lay the weight and burden of importance of getting the church and its authority right, Paul says this church is meant to be the pillar and support of the truth. It is the church which is meant to stand and display the gospel for generations. Not die as we've seen. And then Paul goes into defining what this truth is that we're defending in chapter 3 verse 16. Saying and by common confession that is that this is what unites us. Great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifested in the flesh, that is Jesus, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Now, actually, just a a word here. That word angels probably would be better translated messengers. It's the same in Greek. And so it would probably make more sense if we saw it as saying seen by messengers, these messengers who brought the gospel to us. But our confession is Christ Jesus. This, this is what binds us together. It is not a common political leaning. It is not an ethnic background. It is not an economic standing. It is Christ and Christ alone that binds us, church. That is what holds us together. That is the glue that binds us. 
And, and if you are here and not following Christ, then this is what you should know, that this is the truth most fundamental to who we are as a church and is the most central to our existence as a church. It is Jesus Christ. The, the Bible tells us that he, God in the flesh, had to come down to earth because we went away from the path he made us for. And all we deserved was judgment. And all that was waiting for us was eternal judgment. But God so loved us that he sent his son to live and die for us in our place. But that grave didn't hold him down. But three days later, he rose again. Vindicated, as it says in this passage, by the spirit. And seen by the messengers. Living with a physical body resurrected. So that... If anyone would repent and believe and follow him, turn from their old ways and trust in him, trust in his sufficiency, not ours, trusting that I know I'm needy, but he can meet all my needs and more. That if we repent and believe in him, that he will give us new life and eternal life spent with him, saving us from the punishment of our sins. And so now we proclaim his name and fame to all the nations. That is why we gather together. We want to not only proclaim his name each Sunday morning here, but we want to see his name and fame go out and beyond this, these walls. And so if you want to learn more about how you can be saved and how this gospel can change your life, how you can repent and believe in him, come see me or talk to any of our members here. We'd love to help you in that journey. But Paul continues in his letter. And warns in chapter, but gets to his warning in chapter 4, verse 1. So basically everything up to this point before chapter 4, verse 1 was laying out. This is what's at stake. It's this confession. But, chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith. Fall away from this confession. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. Paul's point, this is why we need qualified authorities. The, the selection of these authorities is not a popularity contest. It is not a, a, an assessment of what business skills they may have. But it is a high and holy calling to be the first line of defense for the church's testimony to the truth as they live as examples and defenders of the truth in both word and truth. And, and we need them to be qualified leaders living out these qualities listed in chapter 3 because there will come a day, Paul says, when some people, whether it's in our church or outside of our church or around our church, will fall away from the faith. And if we drop our standards of who is qualified to lead, we lose one of our greatest aids and defenses in the vitality of the church in this message. Paul's point in calling our attention to all this is to stress the importance and the pressure and the pressure the church should feel in assuring they have enough of these qualified leaders raised up. One is not enough. Is three enough? Two deacons? Is that enough? Be praying for our church. Be praying. If these churches that were in homes had plural deacons and elders, pastors, how much more should we? But that leads us now to the third and final truth Paul gives us for living by as a church. So we've seen we are needy, that we are blessed by qualified authorities, and now we will see that godliness is our gain. Beginning in chapter 4, verse 6. Look look with me there. Paul, speaking to Timothy, says, In pointing out these things to the brothers, meaning all these truths that Paul has been elaborating on, You will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Essentially, Paul is giving a a call to Timothy as the leader to persevere in doing the right thing and teaching sound doctrine and truth and not being swayed by others from the truth. Sometimes half the battle in leadership is just knowing what is what is right and what you should do. And Paul here is telling Timothy and all our leaders today what we need to do. He is saying to teach and preach the gospel, to teach and preach these truths. As you stick to the truth, you will be trained through the process. So what comes first in leadership? Is it knowledge or is it doing? Well, it seems like they go hand in hand. We can't say, well, I don't know enough yet. 
I'm not a mature enough disciple yet to go share the gospel. I'm not a mature enough disciple to speak up. I'm not a mature enough disciple to do this or that. The reality is you won't mature until you do it. But Paul continues in chapter 4, verse 7, to say not only what the leaders should do, but also what they shouldn't do when he says, but refuse godless myths fit only for old women. On the other hand, so refuse that way, but rather train yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily training is only of little profit. I mean, it only lasts for at most your lifetime. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life, just like bodily training, and also for the life to come. And so this growing in godliness is likened to working out, but compared to how physical strength will fade away at some point, our spiritual strength and godliness never has to. Paul is contrasting on what our leaders should and shouldn't do. Our leaders should not need to tie themselves down in countless little controversies whether that's inside or outside the church. Instead, what the church church and its leaders need to do, Paul says, is focus on growing in godliness. And Paul shows this is an infinitely better investment as a leader. And so he concludes the the point in chapter 4, verse 9, by telling us that this is a trustworthy saying and deserving full acceptance. There's our last trustworthy saying, which has preceded this. So, Paul starts with the leaders being called to work out their godliness because it often starts there. Godliness is more caught than taught. Is oftentimes more caught than taught. You can sit through a lot of Bible studies that talk about how to read your Bible, how to pray, how to share the gospel, how to love your wife and husband, how to be a good neighbor. You've probably all sat through various Bible studies that all address those things. And those are important things to learn about. But we also need to see it modeled. We need to to catch it as we see people live this out. That's why we have to live life together, to catch it from others. And so leaders of PBBC, whether that is leading in the youth or the kids ministry and the Bible studies here on campus or off or in the countless other ways, keep fighting. Keep praying. Keep wrestling for godliness. Keep becoming more like Christ. That is our task as a leader, first and foremost. It is not to spend countless hours in mere preparation for a lesson or study or strategizing for events or whatever it is. Your first and foremost task is to grow in godliness in the context of your own walk, in the context of your family and beyond. And so let those that you serve be caught up in Christ by your example of godliness and the word. So Paul calls the leaders to be this kind of model, but that doesn't mean or deter Paul from giving us some practical examples and specifics of how this works out and and is applied in our day-to-day lives beyond the leaders. And that's what he goes into beginning in chapter 5 of verse 1 to 2, for example. Paul gives us one example of many and what this godliness will look like. He says, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather plead with him as a father. To the younger men as brothers, to the older women as mothers, and to the younger women as sisters in all purity. Paul's essentially giving tips on how how we can look more like Christ in all our relationships. First, Paul starts with dealing with different genders and ages, but then he goes into how we should honor and distinguish between widows and, and how to deal with charges against elders and pastors and various other positions and how to handle these things in, in a godly manner. The point is that in all of this, why Paul is giving us this is it just doesn't come naturally. You don't have to command what comes natural. You don't have to command yourself to breathe. But you do have to command yourself to be disciplined. And so this is what Paul is doing. He's, the, the point is, he's going to all these details about all these various little groups and relationships. It's not meant to be a legalistic call to checking the box off. But it is all geared towards helping us see the hard work, much like exercise that we must go through to become like and continue becoming a godly, Christ-like person, family, and church family. And this is the truth, church, that we must live by. 
We as a church must assess ourselves based off needs of godliness and not by things like programs. While we can and should have programs and ministry programs, the call of the church is not to be a center of programs, but a center of godliness, of Christ-likeness. And so as we look for gaps in our church, let's not look for programs we're missing that we could have or that churches down the road have. But let's look at how we are lacking in areas of godliness as a church body. How can we better serve one another? How can we better honor one another? How can we better love one another, respect one another, build one another up? How can we do that better? Instead of maybe coming expecting to be served, expecting for programs to be there or whatever it is. If godliness is Christ-likeness, then we should embody the words of Jesus in Mark 10, 45. There, Jesus tells us what he came for. And the question we have to ask, do we come to the church for the same reason? He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so church, the the question is, do we treat our relationship with the church? Do we treat our relationship in our families with our spouses? Or do we treat our relationship with others around us expecting to be served? Or expecting to serve them? Do we expect to give our life for them? This is the kind of godliness that that we that is gain for us, church. And it can look like small things, even like the singing of songs that aren't your style, perhaps. Maybe you like hymns, or you like contemporary. Maybe the music's too loud, or it's too soft. Or maybe it's Looking like sticking around longer after the service so that you can talk with people and have meaningful conversations with people that go beyond the weather. Or maybe it looks like inviting the new person or the person you don't know very well to have lunch with you or to meet for coffee or whatever it is. It is sacrificing your own convenience for the benefit of others to get to know them, to love them, to serve them. The the ways this could look, hence why Paul gives so many examples at the end of this letter, is countless, is is limitless. And that's the beauty of godliness, church, is we don't have to limit ourselves to just one or two focuses. There's no limit in, in the opportunities God can give us to glorify him as we live out faithfully as a church body. If our pursuit is not after numbers or attenders or programs, but after serving and living like Christ, then the options before us are limitless. And so thank you, church, for what you are already doing, how we are already living in this way and as we live this out more it excites me to think what we can be doing together what god will do through us as we grow in godliness but paul concludes in chapter 6 of verse 20 to 21 with one final plea that we can't look over that we can't overlook paul says oh timothy guard what has been entrusted to you turning aside from godless and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge which some, while professing, have gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. Paul ends his letter with a final call to Timothy and the church to guard this gospel, to not turn astray from the faith, to not lose sight of these truths that the church must live by. And so while there can be many factors that contribute to a local congregation dying out, Paul's charge to us is to keep guarding the gospel and word. Don't let it be assumed, but let it consume us as a church, as families, and as individuals. Never forget we are needy, that we need each other, that we need the gospel, we need God. Never forget that qualified authorities are a blessing that we can trust, and that they help us and serve us and protect us and keep us to help us persevere. And that godliness is great great gain for us, church, here. Numbers are not gain. Finances are not gain. Godliness is. Let these be the truths we live by as a church. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sufficiency of your word. We thank you that you give us all that we need to live by. And we just pray, Father, that you would help us. Help us to... Live this out as as a church body. Help us to continually assess where we come short and help us continually to grow in embracing these truths to your glory and to your son's fame. 
Lord, we pray, Father, that you would build us up as a, as a body of believers to, to see more churches strengthened and to see less fade away. Lord, help us to see more churches planted, to see godliness as gain here in the bay, to see the word defended, and to see leaders raised up for your kingdom. And we just entrust this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We have our, our time of confession, and I want to read to you Psalm 103, verses 1 through 10. My soul, bless the Lord, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse you or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. And you know, church, I, I, I want to go back to verse 2. I want to ask you, if you look at these things that God has done for us, has your soul not forgotten? It says, do not forget. Do not forget. And I think we need to pray because we do forget. We do forget all the things he does for us. Let's pray. God, we just come before you and we are humbled because we know that, that you are a God who loves us, who doesn't deal with our sins the way that, they, that uh, we deserve. And God, you've done so many things for us. You've given us salvation through your son. All of these things that, that you have done, Lord, we, we take for granted. We forget. We uh, don't remember and we don't uh, worship you the way that we should. We don't thank you the way that we should. But God, we ask for your forgiveness now. We ask, Lord, that you would help our souls not to forget, to remember those things and to worship you fully, understanding what you've done for us and understanding who you are. God, we love you and we thank you for your forgiveness that you promised to give. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Amen. God bless you all. Have a good week.